Good evening, everyone. I think we're going to get underway. If you could please take your seats. All right. All right, good evening, everyone. I think we're ready to get started. Thank you. We're just having a few of the last individuals come in in the back, but good evening. My name is Elizabeth O'Neill. I'm the executive director of Chicago Booth's Rothman London campus. And it really is my pleasure to welcome you all here um, this evening. So thank you very much for being here. We've got a nice mix of, and a full house, um, alumni, students, guests, colleagues, and we're looking forward to a great session this evening. Tonight, we are marking two very important milestones for the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. First, as many of you know, throughout 2023, Chicago Booth will celebrate its 125th anniversary in a number of exciting ways, including hosting social events across the globe featuring faculty, alumni, students, and leaders from the business community. And secondly, we are delighted that as part of the 125th celebrations in London, we have our inaugural Rothman Faculty in Residence Lecture from Raghuram Rajan. He is the Catherine Dusik Miller Distinguished Service Professor of Finance, and he will be based in London, I'm very pleased to say, for the entire spring quarter. So throughout the year on the Rothman London campus, we do a number of things. It's home to our executive MBA program for MIA, and there's a class here tonight, EXP28, finishing their final session week. So our hearts go out to them. They will, they will miss this campus, but they are working hard this week. We're pleased they're joining us this evening. We host executive education short courses. We host events um, from Booth's academic centers as well as from the college. And there are also small groups of university undergraduate students studying with us on campus on a regular basis. The campus also serves as a regional hub for our alumni community and provides a state of the art facility for hosting lectures and convening conferences and meetings. The launch of our first global faculty in residence program builds on these ongoing activities and provides increased access to the school's world-class thought leadership, helping to strengthen and broaden boost visibility outside of our home campus in Chicago. So in celebration of 125 years of ideas, of innovation, and of impact, and in recognition of our global presence and our groundbreaking faculty, it is my pleasure to say a few words of introduction to this evening's featured speaker, Raghu Rajan. Professor Rajan's full profile was shared with you as part of the event registration and can also be found uh, on the Chicago Booth website. Too many things to mention here this evening, but to highlight a few of his many career accomplishments, Professor Rajan was the 23rd governor of the Reserve Bank of India between 2013 and 2016. And between 2003 and 2006, he was the chief economist and director of research at the International Monetary Fund. His research interests are in banking, corporate finance, and economic development. And he's written numerous books, research papers, and articles, including his most recent book, The Third Pillar, How the State and Markets Hold the Community Behind. This book was a finalist, in fact, for the Financial Times Business Book of the Year Prize. So he's one of today's most influential economic thinkers, and we are delighted that Professor Rajan is with us in London, and it is my pleasure to invite him to the stage for this evening's session, going beyond the annual report to explore the objectives of modern corporation in society. So please join me in welcoming Professor Rajan. Great, now I have turned on my mic. That was the most important thing to remember once I get on, got on. Thanks very much for coming here. It's wonderful to see all of you. Some of you I have uh, taught and uh, you know, great to be back again with all of you. What I wanna talk about today is, uh, is not central banking, not monetary policy, not banking, but something I've worked on and off on for the last uh, 20 plus years with uh, many, much of the work with Luigi Zingales, uh, some of you may remember Luigi uh, 
and his courses. Um, really the role of the modern corporation. And, uh, and uh, what I want to do today is walk you through a little bit of the thinking uh, on the objectives of the corporation and you know whether it works or it doesn't, and then go on to talk about some recent research that Luigi and I have done uh, on these objectives. So that's where we're going. Um, let me start first with the obvious, right? We have tremendous social problems. Uh, the pandemic has obviously contributed to making many of them worse. Um, amongst them, we have left behind communities in this country, in the United States. Uh, we have racial disparities as uh, highlighted by the George Floyd case, but by so much else. Uh, and we have climate change, which is upon us, and uh, massive amounts of uh, migration, likely as a result of uh, some areas of the world becoming uninhabitable uh, and, and certainly being very um, uh, sort of harsh environments. And in the midst of all this, we have totally paralyzed government uh, in, a, in a number of countries, certainly in the United States, uh, we have a debt ceiling, which is coming fast and, and hard on us. And uh, uh, there is some speculation that we may have the first default in U.S. history. Uh, certainly credit default swaps increasingly are reflecting the still small probability that that might happen. Um, so in this environment, uh, clearly lots of problems, lots of need to do more. And if governments can't step up to the plate, perhaps corporations should do. Uh, and there's a massive movement. Uh, some of you who are board members know the pressure on you to deliver on ESG, environment, social, and, and governance aspects of business. So the question, of course, immediately is, will it work? Will corporations step up to do what, the, uh, what governments cannot? Um, and, uh, you know, if so, uh, how well uh, will it work? And that's really uh, the, the focus of this talk. I want to spend some time on uh, thinking behind corporations and their objectives and, and how they might deliver on them, and then talk about what U.S. corporations are doing now uh, based on reading uh, nearly 9,000 annual reports starting from 1955. We didn't actually read them. We machine read them, but uh, nevertheless. Okay, so that's where we're going. And, and I want to start, as, as always, with Adam Smith. And, uh, you know, Wealth of Nations is such a brilliant uh, book. And following on uh, theory of moral sentiments, he's truly a great thinker. Um, and actually, uh, last week I was at uh, Glasgow University where he spent a lot of his time and uh, discovered that he and uh, David Hume uh, sort of uh, were uh, at the university together. And they were good friends. And it does raise the interesting question, how come you get these, these sort of pockets of greatness emerge? Uh, hopefully, the University of Chicago is one such pocket. Those those Nobel laureates on the on the panel. But how how do people sort of fertilize each other? Anyway, that's a side thought. Uh, Adam Smith was skeptical of corporations. In the Wealth of Nations, he writes about them in a very derogatory fashion. He thought they were inefficient, and uh, you know he based this on the fact that they had a poor survival record despite being granted massive privileges uh, like tariffs or monopolies. Um, you know, he talked about the Royal African Company, which was dissolved in 1733 because it was, uh, it was not successful, didn't make profits. And of course, the more famous South Sea Company, which had the monopoly of trade uh, in the South Seas and was uh, part of the famous South Sea bubble. Both these were actually slaving companies. Uh, big part of their business was slavery. Uh, but despite all the benefits they got, they simply did not uh, work out, okay? And um, so um, Adam Smith said, these companies are almost bound to be inefficient because of what we now call agency costs, right? 
And what did he mean by that? Uh, he meant that uh, really uh, company shareholders were the true owners and they were dependent on corporate management. But, and I quote now, the directors of such companies, however, by directors he meant managers, being the managers rather of other people's money than of their own, it cannot be expected they should watch over it with the same anxious vigilance with which the partners in a private co-partnery frequently watch over their own. In other words, partners have their money at stake. They're more careful. They're going to do the right thing. But, you know, directors who are managing, on before, uh, managing other people's money, less likely to be careful. Um, these famous words have been off-quoted. Like the stewards of a rich man, they're apt to consider attention to small matters as not for their master's honor. In other words, they're not going to pay attention because it's not their money, it's somebody else's money. Negligence and profusion, therefore, must always prevail, more or less, in the management of the affairs of such a company. And it's upon this account that joint stock companies for foreign trade have seldom been able to maintain the competition against private adventurers, against sort of owner-managed companies. They have been accordingly, they have accordingly very seldom succeeded without an exclusive privilege and frequently have not succeeded with one. In other words, they're inefficient. But basically, he was talking about two strikes against the private corporation. One, they got undue privilege, uh, not just, I mean, from uh, limited liability, but also from corporate monopolies that they were granted. And the second, there were substantial agency costs. It would be better if managers were owners as in a partnership, because otherwise they simply could not control the firm. Now let's fast forward, because we don't have a huge amount of time. Go to the Great Depression, in, uh, in the midst of which Burley and Means wrote in 1932 that Adam Smith's fears had truly come to pass, that there were a few large corporations that now dominated every industry. So there was a certain am amount of oligopoly profits. But also, managers no longer paid any attention to shareholders. These were large corporations. Every shareholder was small and atomist, uh, atomistic. And so basically, managers exercised power without responsibility. And so they pushed very hard for minority investor protection because they thought corporations otherwise were simply not going to do the right thing by their owners, okay? So that was Burley and Means uh, about the modern corporation and private property uh, published in 1932. And then let's fast forward another, you know, uh, 30, 35 years. Uh, 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 Milton Friedman in uh, both um, his book, Free to Choose, as well as in a very powerful article in the New York Times in 1970, uh, basically was focused on a different source of agency. You know, we've already talked about managers not working for shareholders. Uh, Adam Smith, uh, uh, Milton Friedman was worried about managers working for everybody else, that they were pressured to do the public good, and he felt that was a total aberration. Uh, Basically, he said, businessmen believe they're defending free enterprise when they declaim that business is not concerned merely with profit, but also promoting desirable social ends. And by this, he meant things like providing employment, eliminating discrimination, avoiding pollution, and whatever else may be the catchwords of the contemporary crop of reformers. And he said, anybody who cares about this is practicing pure, undiluted socialism. And remember, socialism had very bad, a very bad connotation in the 1970s. What, were we, what was he trying to say? Essentially, at that time, the Johnson administration was exhorting corporations to stop raising prices, something that might seem familiar nowadays. Many politicians are telling uh, firms one way to stop inflation is stop raising prices. And Friedman saw red with this because his view was the way you stop inflation is by prices adjusting and showing you how to allocate resources. By stopping the price adjustment process, you're just storing up inflation, which will explode at some point. That, so that was one. 
The second is he believed the Johnson administration was responsible for the, for the inflation because of its free spending policies. And it wasn't corporations. Corporations were just reacting to what the government did. And so this double problem of interfering the price process and also generating the inflation yourself, he saw as completely um, uh, you know, uh, beyond the pale. And for managers to then be exhorted to actually curb inflation by reducing uh, their increase in prices, he thought was just silly. And so uh, when he meant when he said socialism, he meant decisions driven by managerial politics rather than the market. And what he wanted was decisions to be driven by the market. Of course, uh, he recognized that you know part of these pressures came simply because you couldn't pass uh, you know these uh, these rules through Congress. And therefore, vested interests tried to push them directly on corporations. In other words, he would be totally against the ESG movement as we see it today, because he would see this as you can't get the government to act, so you're trying to get the corporations to act directly, and that he would find uh, totally beyond the pale. Now, um, so what did he say as a result? He said, there's only one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits. In other words, focus on profits. Everything else is besides the point. Um, now, he also couched this. This is a, a, a phrase which people often forget. He did say the first uh, that its business is to increase its profits, but he also said, so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say engages in open and free competition without deception or fraud. In other words, he's saying corporations should maximize profits, but take the rules of the game as given, not try and build their own monopolies, not try and make the rules such that it gives them effective monopolies. And we'll, we'll come back to this argument in just a bit. Now, if you think about Friedman, what parts are right? And what parts are, uh, are a little more questionable? What broadly is right is that, you know, the sense that maximizing shareholder value maximizes efficiency and in a sense gets us what, uh, what Adam Smith was talking about. How do you make these large corporations efficient? Friedman's answer was maximize shareholder value. How you do that is a different question. We'll come to that in a second. But why, why does it maximize efficiency? For those of you who took classes at Chicago, you know the argument. It's basically like this. Look, think of the corporation as, as creating a pie, okay? And that pie has a bunch of fixed claim holders who take bits of that pie, workers who have fixed wages, uh, debt holders who have fixed claims, uh, suppliers who supply uh, you know, goods. Uh, all of them have claims, but they're relatively fixed claims. So if shareholders have the residual bit, the bit that they get after paying everybody else, then by maximizing shareholder wealth, you're back maximizing the residual portion. And in that process, you're maximizing the size of the pie because everybody else takes fixed bits of it. And so maximizing the residual is like maximizing the whole, right? That's the shareholder value maximization argument. Everybody else is fixed and you're maximizing the whole. In this kind of environment, it doesn't mean, and this is the caricature of Friedman, that the, uh, you're running the company into the ground so as to maximize shareholder value. It's not that you're stealing from your suppliers or, or bilking your employees. You would treat them as best as you think fit given your objective of maximizing overall value. If customers are important, you will treat them well because you want them to come back. You don't want to have a customer for a day. Long-term shareholder value maximization means you treat everybody as you think appropriate, given the interests of maximizing the pie over the long term. So good customer service is not ruled out. Investing in the community is not ruled out. Investing in your employees is not ruled out. All of these make sense, but as interim goals, as interim goals towards the broader goal 
of shareholder value maximization. Stakeholders like customers, community, are all interim objectives. They're not the final objective. They're the path to the final objective. Now, of course, there are a couple of things missing in Friedman. Uh, one, of course, is the agency cost problem that, that Adam Smith worried about. You know, why would management work in the interests of shareholders, right? And, and one answer which Michael Jensen uh, gave, Jensen is also a University of Chicago graduate, uh, but his uh, famous piece with Murphy in 1990 basically said, look, in the modern US corporation, managers own only a tiny bit of the wealth created by the corporation. So he was an, uh, his was an exhortation to get, give more uh, of the residual value to managers, make them more partner-like so that they had an incentive to maximize the value of shareholders and therefore maximize the value of the company. That created the whole movement to pay managers more, uh, largely through stock-based performance. And as we'll see, today, 70% of the compensation of top management in the US is based on stock. So they do have an incentive to maximize long-term value. The problem, of course, is we've seen massive instances of pay for non-performance, right? Pet boards that basically give their CEOs what they want. Jeff Immelt at GE was a classic example of an overpaid CEO tanking the company on behalf of the shareholders. But there are others like that. And so, uh, you know, so one problem was the pay for non-performance. Another problem, which we can get into, is perverse incentives. You, you might be maximizing shareholder value, but in that process, you might become overly short-term focused. Think of the uh, CEOs in Silicon Valley Bank, uh, you know, making a few pennies, picking up a few pennies in front of the road roller. Uh, the road roller was interest rates. The few pennies were the spreads they made before they went bust. So uh, those are perverse incentives, and uh, certainly in the global financial crisis, um, in this, in, in examples like Enron, you find some of the perverse incentives created by stock-based pay. This is not to deny that there are positives, and somebody like Steve Kaplan, my colleague, would say there are many positives, but we must recognize there are also negatives. The other big question that um, Friedman did not uh, pay uh, enough attention to is, you know, he seemed to deal with the whole politics of corporations by exhorting firms to engage in free and fair competition, right? That addressed uh, Adam Smith's concern that corporations would lobby for privilege, would lobby for monopolies. But does this sort of exhortation that they shouldn't do it address the issue? Certainly not. Because some people would say that telling corporations to maximize shareholder value, well, what's one way of maximizing shareholder value? Change the rules. Change the rules to benefit the corporation. Well, in that case, large corporations have very strong incentives to lobby government, to uh, you know, uh, lobby the press, to uh, have these, these, these sort of NGOs set up, which, which sort of spread the word that these corporations are doing wonderful things, um, you know, uh, what, what's to prevent that? And all Friedman has to say about that is be good, right? And, and certainly that's not enough. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and you sometimes wonder if uh, basically he finessed the whole issue of corporations entering politics to further shareholder value as, as you know, something that, you know, didn't accord with his, with his model. Um, so uh, in response, uh, we have uh, what one might call the stakeholder view. Sometimes this is called, you know, companies should have a purpose. Uh, and certainly it's consistent with the progressive uh, view in American politics. And, and this starts with the, the sense that, yes, we should not give companies privileged uh, monopolies wherever possible. Lena Khan at the FTC today is an example of this kind of view that uh, even size uh, is a problem when corporations get large enough to influence 
uh, you know, uh, the public purpose, that's a problem. And uh, uh, that sort of Brandeisian view uh, suggests we should keep corporations small uh, just because that prevents them from getting excessive power. Um, but this progressive uh, view also points to the contradiction uh, between Friedman's uh, first element and the second. If you tell corporations to be greedy, one way they will be greedy is by grabbing privileges. So the public purpose as well as the private purpose don't sit well together. They recognize that, they recognize the flaw in that argument, but then have a flaw of their own, which is, oh, uh, yes, so uh, since we can't have managers working for shareholders, that makes the corporation too concentrated and, and too, too powerful. Uh, let's have managers to work for the broader interest, to work for various to stakeholders, to work for society. The problem, of course, is this sort of makes managers work for diverse interests. Who's going to keep track of whether managers are doing the right thing or not? If you don't have one metric, if you allow them multiple metrics, then aren't you opening the door for massive agency problems, right? The problems that, uh, that Milton Friedman talked about where I'm spending company money in order to uh, sort of fund the New York uh, Philharmonic simply because my wife gets a wonderful seat on the board or vice versa, my husband gets a wonderful seat on the board. But this is sort of using company money as, as your private fiefdom. So what's to prevent that? Well, New York Philharmonic is a stakeholder, is a valued institution in society. Why doesn't the company spend on that, right? And so companies can lose their way. Um, either they can try doing everything and not be held to any, any, uh, any uh, sort of metric, or um, uh, you know, they, 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 they can basically underperform. So the, the problem with the Purposive, uh, purposive stakeholder view is it has a view of managers as angels. These guys are not only going to satisfy some kind of a social welfare, uh, they're going to maximize some kind of a social welfare function, but it doesn't matter that they're not paid to do it in any effective way, they will do it nevertheless, and we can all trust them to do the right thing. Uh, that's a little hard uh, to, to subscribe to. So um, one example of, uh, of managers uh, sort of trying to do this or saying they do this is the business round table. This is a, you know, a bunch of large companies in the US which uh, comes out every 20 years with a statement about what the purpose of the corporation is. In 1980, they basically said it's all about stakeholders in uh, 1997, it, they said it's only shareholder value maximization. And in 2019, they said, again, it's all about stakeholders. So they flip and they flop. Uh, but here's a statement they made. And you tell me, uh, each of our stakeholders is essential. We commit to deliver value to all of them for the future success of our companies, our communities, and our country. Who could have any problems with such a statement? It sounds wonderful, right? But what exactly are you going to do when you say something like this? How are you going to make choices? How are you going to be held responsible for those choices? And this gives you basically no metric. If everyone is essential, no one is, right? Which is why, uh, you know, the Shell uh, CEO's daughter basically asked him, oh, you signed on to the statement. Well, why don't you sell the firm and give the proceeds to Greenpeace? You know, that's wonderful. You will be, you know, helping one stakeholder, you'll be helping the community, you'll be helping the world. Because there's nothing in the statement which says, you know, my job is to produce energy at low cost or whatever Shell does. But there's no nothing. It's it's we're going to be good to everyone. And being good to everyone is not a reasonable objective. So so the problem with this is um it creates agency problems in spades. Who holds management to account? For what? Why would we trust management to be angelic? Uh, you know, one example of, uh, of trust and how it gets misplaced is we trusted the platforms to police content. It was about self-policing. We gave them the right to police it. Look where that's got us, right? 
Now everybody's saying, well, perhaps we need public policy on this. We need rules and regulations. So uh, I, I think um, you know at some point uh, we need to we need to draw a line. And um, one of the uh, questions is whether the uh, stakeholder view draws the appropriate lines. Now there are interim positions. Let me go quickly through that, and then I'll come to some recent research. Um, one is, uh, you know, stakeholders as interim, uh, but explicit goals, right? I said Milton Friedman was stakeholders as interim, but not explicit goals. Now, some companies are saying, we care more about certain stakeholders than others. They're making a choice, different from the business roundtable. One example of this is Google with its Maven project. I don't know if uh, you, you remember that. Uh, project Maven was a project by the Department of Defense to essentially, uh, um, you know, use uh, AI to better target drones, uh, to uh, target uh, military drones more effectively and, and hit targets. And of course, uh, Google employees uh, tend to be more liberal, tend to be more peaceful, uh, tend to be younger. And many of them sort of stood up and said, we're not working on this project, uh, basically because they thought there would be a lot of collateral damage. They simply were not in the business of getting uh, drones to target people. And um, eventually, Google decided that it would abandon the project and favor its employees over the Department of Defense. And you can think that this might be a way of explicitly saying we care about our employees, we care about their feelings, and we are going to do things which make this a better place for them to work in. In the process, the implicit understanding is they accept lower pay and show more loyalty to Google because this is the right place for them to work as opposed to an organization like Palantir or something else which is more military focused. So it becomes a win-win because for employees, I'm in a company which shares my values. And for the company, well, because they, uh, we have values that they subscribe to, then perhaps they demand lower pay, it increases the bottom line. Now, nobody's gonna say that explicitly, but that's the implicit bargain, that because we're being nice to our employees and we show them that we care about them, they are nice back to us. And so this could be shareholder value maximization, but with stakeholders as an interim goal. Another uh, version of this is where instead of maximizing shareholder value, I care about shareholder preferences, and I'm trying to maximize that. This is something that uh, Luigi uh, Zingales, along with Oliver Hart, who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago, have propounded as a theory. And here's the point. Milton Friedman said, you know, shareholders, the best thing we can do for them is maximize the value of the shares. Once we maximize the value of the shares, if they, don't want, if they want to do good in the world, if they want to donate to the local soccer team, if they want to uh, you know, prevent gun violence, all they have to do is take the money that they get from their shares and go and donate to the appropriate charity, right? So Friedman's point was, you maximize shareholder value, give them the maximum freedom to do the things that they want. And that's the way we should proceed. Now, Luigi and, and Oliver basically say, well, supposing you want to prevent gun violence, and supposing there's a monopoly seller of guns in the country, let's call it Walmart. Now, uh, this is a hypothetical case. Uh, supposing you're a Walmart shareholder, right? So Friedman would say, let Walmart sell all the guns it wants in the country. Then you as a shareholder have maximized the value of your shares. And you go out and buy back those guns, right? You fund police departments to buy back those guns. End result, guns aren't sold and you're happy, okay? Now, Oliver and Luigi said, basically, this is a very, very, um, you know, extended and costly process, and you'll do less well than supposing you had shareholders who were against gun violence, just stop Walmart from selling guns. And that would be a more immediate 
and lower cost process of maximizing shareholder preferences. Okay, so there is a problem with uh, with Friedman's argument, which is you're assuming the process uh, works entirely through money and is as effective. Uh, may not. Maybe more direct intervention is more effective. And so, if you wanted to maximize the shareholders' preferences here, and most of your shareholders cared about minimizing gun violence, you should stop selling guns, right? And there are some companies which have stopped, stopped selling guns in the US. Um, but, but the point is, uh, I think, how do you operationalize this? That becomes more difficult. How do I find out what my shareholders care about? And how do I figure out then what to do? So that's, that's the, the beauty of Friedman's argument is it's easy to operationalize. I just maximize value and then they do what they want. I don't need to know who owns my shares or what they think. Here I have to conduct surveys of my shareholders on every social issue and figure out what they think and that becomes more problematic. So what's the uh, bottom line here? The bottom line is that um, none of the theories really explain how to limit monopolization by large corporations. And you know, one of the problems in both the UK and the US is a significant uh, oligopoly structure in a variety of industries, including uh, healthcare, for example, in the in, in United States. Um, somehow, uh, I think what we're left it with is uh, this is only going to work out through some kind of, uh, you know, broad uh, muddling through. It's not going to be done precisely. It's go not going to be done effectively. Basically, what you need is what Madison used to call factions. You need many interests in society, all of which uh, fight each other to ensure no interest becomes really powerful. So if you have large corporations, you have large unions, you have uh, you know, um, academics who believe in, uh, in strong antitrust. You have academics who believe in free markets and no antitrust. All of them colliding together keeps society broadly honest. Essentially, um, you have uh, Brandesian antitrust, which limits the size of corporations, fighting against Borkian antitrust, which says it's only the consumer who matters. Uh, and, and, and they collide and get you the right answer. Another way you could get the right answer is competition between systems. If any system uh, essentially uh, becomes very inefficient, then competition from other systems comes in and keeps the system on us. So the US gets overly inefficient, Japan or China come in with their systems, challenge the US system, and the US system has to look inward to find out better answers. So those are possibilities that would keep the system honest. The point is the, the pressure to change and keep the system honest doesn't come from insight. It comes from challenge, it comes from competition, it comes from outside. The second big question that is re left relatively unanswered is agency problems. They certainly are likely to be minimized when management maximizes long-term shareholder value, but how do we incentivize management to do that? And you know, shareholder, uh, you know, compensating on with shares uh, is part of the answer, but it's not the entire answer because we've seen distortions associated with it. And of course, there's a very big question nowadays: what about the externalities associated with corporations, the emissions, uh, the pollution, the fact that they could also contribute to societal solutions like uh, having more diversity and inclusion in the corporation. What role do corporations have to play there? And broadly, it comes down to maybe the stuff that Friedman said is not to bother, we should not bother about the politics is really where all the answers are, which also leads us to be a little pessimistic about, you know, we, I started this, uh, this uh, talk by saying, you know, a lot of pressure on corporations to step up to displace the government, to do what the government is not willing to do. The problem is to keep the corporations on the straight and narrow, you also need government. So you need corporations to fix the government and you need government to fix the corporations. So where are we left when government is paralyzed? My sense is you can't rely on corporations to be the answer. You need both, fact, both parts to really work 
to get the answer. And we are uh, in some danger of, of not doing the right thing if we believe that corporations are going to do it. Okay, let me, let me end. Uh, I ha let me take uh, five to 10 minutes on, on evidence on what corporations do. Um, you know, uh, what Luigi and I did was uh, walk through over 9,000 annual reports by corporations, uh, trying to find out what do corporations say they do? What are the goals they project? Has this changed over time from 1955? And why did it change? And, you know, does what corporations say to do have consequences? Okay, so we study uh, nearly 9,000 letters uh, from Fortune 150 companies to their shareholders. I mean, here's a letter. Uh, you may not be able to read it. Uh, it's, uh, it's from Amazon. And basically, Amazon says, we believe uh, in long-term shareholder value maximization. Uh, we think that this will come from having a market leadership position. Now, Amazon saying that it wants a market leadership position sounds a lot like Adam Smith's worry about corporations that they will seize uh, monopoly privileges uh, by shutting out the competition. Nevertheless, they say it quite explicitly, market leadership is going to be the way to shareholder value maximization. Okay, um, What we find is uh, there are a lot of objectives stated by corporations, but they fall you know, broadly uh, we can classify them into 13. Uh, one is shareholder value maximization. Sometimes they explicitly talk about value maximization. We call that shareholder value maximization narrow. Sometimes they call about cost, they talk about cost reduction, profit enhancement, et cetera. The other things corporations talk about, growth, very important. Uh, innovation, again, important. Risk management, debt reduction, that's another uh, 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 objective many corporations have. Clearly, corporations talk about enhancing uh, the value of their stakeholders, customers, employees, suppliers, community, uh, and stakeholders more generally. They also talk about society at large. We care about you know, strong ethics. We care about philanthropy. We care about diversity and inclusion. We call this ESG social. And they also talk about emissions and pollution, we call this ESG environment. So our question is, what have corporations been saying over time? Uh, the first and uh, key trend is they say more and more. They say we do more and more over time. There's an explosion in the number of goals. And uh, here, what you need to look at is the blue line is the company's that the share of companies that announce zero goals. It used to be 60%, now it's zero. No company has no goals now, okay? What about multiple goals? That was 20%, it's now 100%. All companies have many goals. So the idea that you have one and only one goal, maximize shareholder value, never was the case and uh, is not the case now, okay? Um, what about the average number of goals? Uh, conditional on having a goal, it's gone from two to seven, okay? So the typical company now says it does many things. Here's an example. International paper says, we continue to lead the world in responsible forest stewardship, improve the lives of our employees, uh, address critical needs in the community, reduce our global manufacturing emissions, long-term value for shareholders, for all stakeholders, I should say, uh, deliver cost of capital returns, uh, create value for everyone. Okay, so, uh, I mean, this is su a summary of what they say they do. They do more things than this, okay? <laughs> so, so basically, something for everyone, okay? Uh, uh, other trends, uh, most firms mentioned a shareholder-oriented goal even before Milton Friedman, okay? And uh, Milton Friedman, uh, you know, uh, just look at this. Uh, the upper line is broadly uh, anything that is related to uh, maximizing the bottom line. 
we focus on increasing profits, we focus on increasing shareholder returns, any statement of that kind in the annual report, uh, about 40% of companies said that in 1955, today about 80% say it, okay? Um, what about shareholder value maximization? This is what it looks like. The word shareholder value maximization is used very infrequently. It starts taking off in the 1980s, long after Friedman wrote his article. So it wasn't that Friedman changed everything. Um, as with much academic work, it's something that he said, eventually perhaps it got picked up and people said, oh, Friedman changed everything. No, it, uh, it got picked up and went up. Well, one interesting point in that, uh, in that uh, piece is note that companies now, even though the number of objectives that they talk about has exploded, fewer and fewer of companies are talking about shareholder value maximization, okay? That decline is also interesting. Um, we'll come back to why a little later. Um, okay, uh, shareholder value maximization explored in the 80s and 90s, and stakeholder goals surged also at the same time. So the explosion in goals took place at the same time as companies ta started talking about shareholder value. One of the interesting things, Many companies now say we're about diversity and inclusion. And clearly, uh, Black Lives Matter, some of what happened recently, George Floyd, all that played a role. But interestingly, companies started talking about diversity and inclusion in the 50s and 60s. Remember what happened then? The civil rights movement, okay? Around the civil rights movement, more and more companies are talking about diversity and inclusion. But it doesn't stay that way. It goes down in the 70s. Remember Nixon's Southern strategy? There were occasions when politics went the other way. And when politics went the other way, companies went the other way, okay? Uh, it comes back, of course, most recently, enormous in, in interest in diversity and inclusion in the last, last 10 years. Um, so, uh, this sort of raises the question, why do companies do what they do? Why do they say we do something? And um, can we get uh, some sense of what companies maximize? So here are uh, five quick reasons uh, they say they do what they do. Um, I'm going to just uh, talk through these in the interest of time uh, rather than show you uh, what's going on. Uh, the first is changed audience power. The uh, pressures on the corporation from those who listen to it has changed over time. And perhaps the biggest change is the increase in institutional share ownership. Uh, the more institutional share ownership there's been, the more pressure there's been on corporations to say what they do and also to emphasize shareholder value maximization. So shareholder value maximization went up with, uh, with uh, with institutional ownership in the 1980s. But in addition, we also see that takeover pressure made a big change in companies saying we maximize shareholder value, okay? Companies also started talking a lot about maximizing the value of the customer. And so we, we thought, well, what might be driving it uh, in the 80s? And there, think about what uh, US car companies started doing. They started caring about customers, why? because the Japanese started coming in a big way. So one of the things we checked was, if you are a expo exposed to imports and you're a customer, uh, customer facing company, do we see an increase in your announcing you're all about customers? And it turns out that's exactly right. That companies that are more customer facing uh, in industries that are subject to more competition suddenly become much more committed to the customer. Okay, um, changes in audience preferences, okay? Uh, what we also find is that companies cater to the preferences of audiences. I, I told you that institutional ownership mattered. A whole bunch of institutions signed up to what are called uh, PRI norms. Uh, these are principles of responsible investing, which Kofi Annan, uh, in his time as uh, UN uh, Secretary General, pushed on corporations around the world. And what you find is that companies that have a larger set of institutional shareholders 
who have signed up to PRI tend to say they're all about things that PRI guys care about. So they're much more about ESG, social, diversity and inclusion, uh, or ESG environment. Um, companies also announce objectives when they want to commit to firm-specific improvement. And this may cause some cynicism in you. It turns out that I'm all about the environment when I either had an oil spill or I was fined by the EPA for environmental violation, okay? It turns out I'm about shareholder value maximization when I just made big losses. Yeah? So companies react to their specific situation. The non-cynical way of saying this is this is an attempt to commit. So when they have high debt loads, they commit to risk management, to bringing down their debt load. When they have low profits, they commit to increasing their profits. Turns out they don't have much effect in terms of performance, but they certainly commit to doing the right thing. Um, they also commit to specific stakeholders. I gave you the Google Maven project uh, idea. It turns out when companies have highly paid employees, typically employees that are hard to find and hard to keep, they tend to be much more focused on employee welfare. They tend to say the right things by their employees. So that's another example of what they do. But you know, what all this says they do things for the right reasons. Uh, one of the things we also find is they do things just to deflect pressure. So for example, there's the famous opioid seven, seven companies that were caught up in the opioid scandal. Uh, selling opioids. These are uh, pharmacies um, that didn't pay enough attention to who was buying the opioids. Uh, big lawsuits against them. Suddenly, these companies, around the time the lawsuits start, find they're about everything good. So objectives become, we're for community, we're for society, we're for ESG social, we're for ESG environment. Their objectives explode. Uh, and most of the objectives are good objectives. So, so uh, that's, that's consistent with them deflecting pressure. So these are some of the findings in our analysis. Uh, you know, let me just show you one slide uh, to uh, you know, give you a sense. Uh, lots of regressions I want to show you, but I, I'll, I'll avoid that. Uh, sorry. Um, here is ethics objective. Uh, the ethics, so what we did was we did a count, both in the New York Times and in Google's n-grams, of how many times the word accounting fraud is uh, in the papers or in books. And then we plotted uh, objectives of companies saying we care about ethics. Strong correlation. What do you think happened in the early 2000s? Enron happened, right? Enron raised a whole lot of attention to corporate ethics, so companies suddenly became all about ethics. This is just a way of saying companies respond to public pressure. And, and this may be you know, what uh, Milton Friedman was railing about, but may also be the way you sort of keep companies on uh, doing what is, what is broadly in societal interest. Last point, does it work? Well, one way to see if it works is to see whether uh, you know, corporate managers get paid according to this. It turns out not much. If you look at what they paid, 70% uh, is long-term incentives, that is share, share price. 11% um, is fixed salary, so it doesn't vary with performance. Only 20% is a bonus related to all of this. It turns out, for non-financial metrics, such as the environment, such as diversity and inclusion, it's about two and a half to four and a half percent of pay. Is that big? Is that small? I would guess it's relatively small. What is interesting, however, is on the key metrics that are beyond long-term shareholder value maximization. You could argue they don't need to be paid for employee welfare because that's part of the broader objective of maximizing the value of the company. But on environment and diversity and inclusion, there are special metrics set aside and companies that say they're about that also pay a little bit for that. So that's, that's sort of the good news. What's the bad news? 
does it have any effect? Well, it turns out that you know, companies like Sustainalytics measure how much, how well you do on ESG. And it turns out that companies that say we're about ESG, that say we're about diversity, with that say we're about the environment, score really high on Sustainalytics scores. And so that gave us a lot of, uh, you know, we had a good feeling about that, well, something's working. But then you probe deeper. You look at what Sustainalytics scores they score well on. It's almost entirely process. Did I start measuring uh, my emissions? Did I uh, start a program uh, to uh, talk about diversity and inclusion? Uh, but if you look at uh, what exactly uh, you know, they achieve, do they have lower EPA fines? Do they have lower emissions? hard to find any difference. So it's all about process. They basically tick the right box that Sustainalytics measures, but in terms of outcomes, not yet. Maybe uh, it's early days, maybe in five to 10 years, companies that say they're about the environment will actually bring down their emissions. Right now, it's very hard to find any evidence that they actually do it. So let me end. Uh, I know we're way above, uh, beyond time. Uh, to sum up, business goals have proliferated over time uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, which I talked about. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think we, we need to basically uh, try and uh, be a little more um, measured in what we think corporations can do. They are subject to outside pressure. So, you know, if you belong to an NGO which is putting pressure on a corporation, you can be sure it will respond. Question is, will it respond with performance or will it respond with talk? It does respond with talk. That's what we find. It does at least do the measures that people measure, but does it respond with performance? The jury is still out on that. So if you believe that corporations will be the answer to bringing emissions down and to solving the climate problem, I think it's important not to put all your eggs in that one basket, that we need governments to also step up. Let me stop there. Okay. Elizabeth has said we have time for a couple of questions, so I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. There was one slide where you said uh, corporations who live in all the islands and checks with government. Are you talking about selective? Democratically elected governments, or what's your view on non democracies? Yeah, I was talking about democracies here, but even non democracies have uh, often, and not always, have some, let me say sometimes, have to be seen as legitimate. Uh, um, I would argue, for example, um, in, some, um, in some autocracies, uh, there is a need to be seen as legitimate, legitimate because you were never verified by an election. So uh, people at least should want to have you. Um, I'm not talking about repressive autocracies. I'm talking about semi-autocracies like China was before the recent regime. Uh, you, can run your own you can, whether they believe it or not, right? I mean, so why did the Chinese government even more recently suddenly eliminate all COVID restrictions because there was increasing frustration in the public and in a sense that it wasn't doing what it was meant to do. Um, but broadly, my point there was that uh, you cannot sort of wish away the, the political process. All you can hope is it models through and produces reasonable outcomes. Uh, there's no sort of way to push that in a specific direction. Uh, all you can hope is that uh, what Madison said, various factions fighting against each other will keep each other in check 
and you don't go too much in the one direction or too much in the other direction. Similarly, competition between systems will also keep you in that broad direction. And those, to my mind, are the hopes for why corporations may broadly do the right thing. But, you know, it's a hope rather than an axiom. Uh, this is another question. Uh, gentleman there. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, how do governments wrestle back some of that power? Um, there's an assumption that since the 80s with Thatcher and Reagan opening up the free market, that they've kind of let a lot of that power go to corporations. We're now living in an age of high inflation, so governments are having more of a tight monetary policy. So where is that space for the financial funding to kind of wrestle back that power from corporations? Well, I, I think... Um... It's, it, it is a, a debatable question, who has power now? Um, I mean, to some extent, corporations are also hemmed in. I mean, they resp I was showing you they have now announced seven, eight, nine objectives. That's because they have all these stakeholders looking at them and paying close attention to what they're doing. So they are basically, uh, you know, catering to the public. Now, um, you know, Maybe in some situations, uh, they would prefer to have clear, bright lines on what they can do and what they can't do, rather than having to sort of adjust. So one example, uh, should I fund brown projects as a bank, energy intensive projects, or should I not? We clearly know that energy transition will require gas and oil for longer than we would have desired before these geopolitical events emerged. But should banks fund those or not? There is no clear bright line. It is being enforced by activists who go out there and protest uh, against the banks that are funding some of these brown projects, right? What, what should society do? Uh, and it, it's, it's, not, it's not completely clear at this point. So who has power? Does the government have power? No. government doesn't even know how to make a rule here. Does the corporation have power? No, because it, it can't say, I'm going to lend to these guys, you know, damn the public. But it also knows that these projects are needed uh, for what has to, uh, for the transition to take place. So we're in a difficult situation where it's not clear where power lies. So I'm not sure I can answer your question clearly. Uh, gentlemen, uh, gentlemen there. At the beginning of presentation, I think you mentioned that importance of uh, role of corporations is related to incompetence of the elites. And I think that's very interesting observation because definitely there is a decline in competence and uh, ability of elites to think long term and to deliver the desired outcome. I was just uh, very curious to know your opinion. Why would over particularly the last several years was such a significant decay in the elite's ability to resolve uh, systemic and strategic issues. And I would like to pick up on the issue of uh, uh, governments not being able to incentivize more orderly energy transition. Uh, partially, the crisis of uh, today is due to higher energy prices which was caused by short-term myopic decision-making of the elites not to allow to continue on fossil fuel projects seven years ago, and demand and supply suddenly picked up, uh, and the uh, equilibrium is uh, high energy prices, which uh, disrupted the markets. So I was just very curious to know how, what would be the right balance of uh, competence and increase uh, involvement of corporations into influence of the governments. So uh, I'm not sure I said that uh, um, what you started out with, that the corporations were influenced by the incompetence of elites. But I, I, I do think the incompetence of elites um, is certainly a big issue uh, over the last few years, which has made government more difficult. Uh, part of the reason is not so much, well, well, I think a lot of it is around the global financial crisis. Uh, the incompetence is, oh, you were the smartest guys on the street and you messed it all up. So um, not, it was not just incompetence. It was also 
that you were corrupt uh, and and you took the whole system down uh, how can we trust that you can make the right decisions if you the smartest guys in the room uh, iqs of 200 plus um, you know tank the system so that 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 was the the flavor of the argument uh, and and then it it got into you know every issue uh, the gilets jaunes in uh, in france were saying look uh, you care about the end of the world we caring about reaching the end of the month uh, that's because we don't have uh, you know you're talking about hiking uh, uh, taxes on on uh, petrol and gasoline and we travel long distances we don't sort of walk to work uh, we drive long distances to work so uh, you know that the tea party narrative all seem to suggest we're about different interests you elite have a much longer term global view we uh, the average joe have a more shorter term local view and therefore the twin don't meet and you know parties have espoused that the republican party the local um you know uh short term and the democrats the longer term end of the world uh environmental view and and that results in in certainly some decisions now what is short term what is long term one can debate i mean clearly there is climate change coming we need to do something about it but there is also the fact that you are affecting livelihoods with the regulations um you know for example banning coal uh and and so how do you how do you span the gap and uh, societies haven't figured out how to partly because uh you know we've lost all trust in nominating a bunch of people to lead us and to make the decisions for us they're not trusted anymore so i think in that sense uh your uh, loss of faith in the elite is is part of the problem thank you thank you so Thank you one more time, Professor Rajan. I'm sorry, we're gonna to have to end it there. So we're really thrilled again for this thought provoking lecture to kick us off um, the inaugural faculty in residence, the 125th, the first of the celebrations on the London campus. We hope that you will continue the conversation upstairs over networking reception, but we did wanna leave you with just a couple of last comments. Um, fear not, this is not the last occasion for you to come and hear Professor Rajan. In fact, on June 6th, registration will soon be open for a fireside chat that Professor Rajan will be having with Martin Wolf, Chief Economics Commentator from the Financial Times. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads out there, the names, uh, name very well recognized. So we're delighted that will be another evening session here on campus. So you will all receive information on that. We hope that you can join us again to carry on that conversation. And of course, for the alumni in the room, there is still time to make it to Chicago next week for an amazing best of the best 125th celebration for Reconnect Week. Some amazing things going on, um, management conference, we're taking over Wrigley Field. Many of you will know what Wrigley Field is, um, Chicago Cubs home baseball team major league. Um, and that's all happening uh, end of next week and on next Saturday. So still time to join us there. In the meantime, the first floor, um, some drinks and lively conversation awaits. But one more round of applause for this fascinating conversation. Today. Thank you. Professor. Thank you.